All right, good evening, everyone. It's good to see you. We're going to begin tonight by looking in one of, I think, the important Psalms that we'll be studying in this portion in our verse-by-verse -verse study, as well as highlighting truths from the book of Psalms. If there's anything we have learned from the psalmist is that he dealt with danger. He dealt with people that were trying to bring him down. And he calls them his enemies. And if they're his enemies, I think in a sense they are God's enemies. Because David tried to submit himself to God for the most part. Now he wasn't perfect. But I believe Psalm 69 gives to us some real encouragement We've entitled this message, When Life Hurts. You ever feel like life is like in a boxing ring? You get up from the corner and you go at it at life and you face people, circumstances, and you feel like you get knocked out, punched, beaten, you name it, whatever happens to you. And you go back in your corner and the bell rings and you get back up and you go and you wonder sometimes if you take, can take it anymore. That's the theme here in Psalm 69. We find the psalmist is dealing with hardship and feeling somewhat out of control and yet finds comfort, finds safety, finds that knowing God sees it all brings a calmness over him. I think the psalmist very practical. We'll begin in verse number one. We're going to read a few verses and then we're going to get into the message. We're going to highlight some things from Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. I sink in a deep mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dried. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Let's ask the Lord's help. We're glad to see you this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. Use it now to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish in our lives. Speak to our hearts. Lord, encourage us, equip us. And Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will give us guidance and understanding now. Lord, we'll give you thanks for what you do. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen. How would you describe the previous year? Was it a year of hurt or was it a year of healing? Different seasons, different years, weeks, months have their moments of hurt and healing. I'm so glad in, in the end we're going to go to a eternal place where there's no more suffering, heartache, or sorrow. So as children of God, we have the hope in Christ Jesus. But I'd like to introduce to you, by way of introduction that is, what the psalmist described about his hurt, because I think this is something that all of us might recognize and might appreciate from someone like this man who obviously was not beyond anything that we have ever uh, dealt with ourselves. In verse number one, he says, the waters are come in unto my soul. Verse two, he says, I sink deep in mire. Verse two, the floods overflow me. Verse three, I am weary of my crying. Have you ever been hurt so bad or wept so much that you were tired of crying? Verse three, my throat is dried. Verse 4, he says, they hated me without a cause. Verse 12, the authorities speak against me. Verse 12, I was the son of the drunkards. Verse 20, reproach hath broken my heart. And verse 20, he also says, I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. I think we need to understand concerning her the context of what he's dealing with, the enemies he's referring to in the psalm are those that are basically lined up with Saul and many men in his army want to bring him down as well. Also, we know there's hurt that comes from within. You say, what are you talking about? Look at verse number four. They hate me 
They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They that would destroy me, being my enemies, wrongfully are mighty. Then I restore that which I took not away. O God, verse 5, thou knowest my foolishness and my sins are not hid from thee. The truth is, we can, in a sense, sometimes hurt ourselves by the choices, the decisions we make. That will be the hurt from within. And then there's the hurt from without, as we mentioned in verse 4, those that hated me without a cause. So I guess the big question is then, when we study this psalm, is what do you do when you're hurt? When someone's up against you, in the case of the psalmist, Oh, you can take things into your own hands and you can try to fix the situation. We have learned that the psalmist would rather yield himself to God and let God take care of it. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul said, Vengeance is mine. He was re revert, referring back to the Old Testament truth. Vengeance is mine and I will repay, saith the Lord. So tonight I want to share with you, I believe, some encouraging thoughts about what you and I can do when life gets difficult and when we're hurting. First of all, you need to pray to the Lord. You say, that sounds pretty basic. Yes, it is. But you will be amazed what people do when they are hurt and they try to take things into their own hands. And God seems to be the last resort. Actually, it would be our, our first move, drop to our knees, or humble ourselves at the throne of grace. Notice in verse number 13, he says, But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O God, or O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God. Now, this is very, very interesting, because sometimes in the Psalms, you can read some of the dilemmas he's in. Who is the God that we pray to? What is the Lord like? He lists for us three attributes, three characteristics about what the Lord is like. Who is God? Who is the God we pray to? First of all, God is merciful. Look at verse number 13. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Mercy has been described as not getting what you deserved. And all God's people can say, Amen to that. I don't get what I deserve. God is very merciful. The compassions are of the Lord are renewed daily. Great is thy faithfulness. The second attribute that he describes is not only God's mercy, but God's loving kindness. We find that in verse Look at, if you will, in verse number 16. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. I think we can handle our herd a little bit better or a whole lot better if we knew that someone cared for us. And I'm here to tell you, Peter said, Casting all our care upon him, that is upon God, for he cared for you. God has love for you and for me. So the psalmist is praying to someone, not only who's merciful, but who has a lot of love, who's filled with love and kindness. And then the third attribute that we find that he mentions is found in verse number 19, and that is God is all-knowing. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before thee. I'm here to tell you there's not a, an event that goes on in your life. The Bible even says in the gospel according to Matthew that when you comb your hair, that when one hair falls out of our heads, the heavenly secretaries take, care, take note of that. He knows everything. So the psalmist is reminding us God is all-knowing, God is loving, and that God is merciful. That's to whom we cast all our cares upon. That's to whom we pray. So what did he pray about? I want you to see something in verse number 14. First of all, he prayed for deliverance. Deliver me 
out of the mire. In verse 17 and 18, he calls upon God to draw near to him. Sometimes when you are filled with dilemmas that are out of your control and trials, sometimes it's hard to fear near to God or close to God. That's been my experience. When you're in the midst of the miry troubles of life, God seems distant. God seems far away. But He's not. He's promised He will never leave us nor forsake us. The psalmist says in verse 17, And hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. I mean, you talk about a 911 call. God is a present help in the time of our trouble. Can God hear and answer prayer quickly? He's done so. Automatically. Instantaneously. Is there anything too hard for the Lord to do? Deliver me, O God. Crying out to God. Pouring out His heart. Crying. Someone said God says yes. God says no. And sometimes God says wait a little while. God has perfect timing. So He prays for deliverance. He prays for God to be near to him. Notice in verse 18, he prays for God to redeem. Draw nigh unto my soul and redeem it. I take that to refresh my soul. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. Sometimes the trials, sometimes we can allow the troubles to rob us of the joy in our fellowship between us and God. Guilty, been there, done that. Redeem it, O God. But here's the biggie in verses 22 through 28. The psalmist prays that the Lord would allow him to have vengeance. Not him personally, but that God would have vengeance. Let their table soon become a snare before them, that, that they which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine indignation upon them and let the, thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be desolate and let none dwell in their tents. Psalm 69 has many parallels. It also is a messianic psalm. It gives us phrases that the Lord Jesus was dealing with it, with what he was feeling with his enemies as he was about to be crucified. So the psalmist prays. He's praying for God to have vengeance on him, to redeem him, to draw near to him, to deliver him, and to hear him speedily. So the first thing is pray to the Lord, okay? Drop to your knees. Humble yourself and cry out to God. The second thing we find that the psalmist does in the psalm is found in verse 30. There's two thoughts here that I want to share with you. The first one is you need to praise God with a song. Verse 30, I will praise the name of God with a song. Singing can help us move from a time of discouragement to the reality that God is still good. God is gracious. When we are hurting, the last thing we want to do, and this is where our Christian growth takes in, this is where we grow in grace, is that when something is going, we, we get a phone call. It, it seems like we are never steady in our walk, right? We are either dealing with something we're either in the midst of a storm, coming out of a storm, or about to enter another storm. And every time we come out of a storm, we kind of go like, thank you, Lord, for getting us through that. But we have to learn to sing a song and sing a song of praise. This is where Christian growth comes in. Because the opposite of praising God is what the children of Israel we're very prone to do when things went hard for them. You say, what did they do? They murmured and they complained. I don't know about you, but when my kids complained and murmured, or when people in the household murmured, and sometimes I murmured, I don't think my wife liked, liked being around uh, here in Byron complaining. 
But when the children sing and when her husband sings, uh, it's more comfortable. God inhabits the praises of his children. There's power in the believer who learns to praise the Lord because the joy of the Lord is still our strength. So we need to learn to praise God. We need to lift up our hearts and raise a hallelujah. Thirdly, this is a toughie, but it's in the scripture. We need to maintain a heart of thanksgiving. In verse 30, the latter part, the psalmist says, I will praise the name of God with the song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Gratefulness. In everything, we're told, according to the book of Thessalonians, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. The other week, uh, as we were getting ready to drive uh, Jonathan, Lydia, and Santi to the airport, we were headed down to Interstate 40. And would you know it, we hit an object on the road. It looked like a wire. But the wire had something attached to it and caused their tire to go flat. We had just uh, hit that object by Tajali exit. Perfect timing. <laughs> but the last thing I needed on that day to, as I was driving to them to catch their plane was a flat tire. We pulled off the road and it happened to be right there off the interstate. There was no problem in getting the tire down from where it was located. The lug nuts were easy to get off and my son Jonathan and I changed that tire. I kind of thought to myself, we did it so quick we ought to enroll ourselves in the Indy 500. <laughs> I could have murmured and I could have complained, but I was praising God there was a spare tire. I was praising God that it was not in an awkward place. I was thankful that I had a helper and I was thankful that we were back on the road again. The Bible says it like this, and all things work together for the good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So we need to learn to thank God. Maintain a heart of thanksgiving. And then here's the last one. Probably the most difficult sometimes because when our mind is attached to the problems and sometimes what we fear, it could be the loss of a loved one in the hospital. What are we going to do? Who are we going to contact for the funeral and all the things that go on with that? Or maybe we have a loved one that we drove up into the emergency room and we got dinner burning or did I turn off the stove and our mind can go in every direction or maybe we didn't expect uh, the finances that we had. Maybe we found ourselves uh, with the washer breaking down, the water heater breaking, or the car breaking down. There's always something breaking down. And we find ourselves in a crisis situation. What can we do? We need to remember God's promises. This is what he does here. Notice in verse 32, he says, The humble shall see this and be glad. And your heart shall live that seek God. I love that. These are precious promises. Three in particular in this closing psalm. The first means that your heart shall live that seek God. In other words, God is going to see you through this. Did you know, as we have taught before, that nothing can happen in our life, absolutely nothing, unless God has the green light. There had no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. God's grace is sufficient to get us through. The Lord has promised he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Here's the second thought. The Lord hears our prayers and is not a respecter of persons. He tells us here in verse number 33, the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. 
Isn't that interesting? There are some believers, some that fear God, that end up in prison. But it doesn't mean necessarily that they are in sin. It could be they're suffering for righteousness sakes because there are brothers and sisters in third world countries that are suffering for righteousness sakes. And so God in this passage reminds us he does not spise his prisoners. But there's a third thing, and I think this is a big thing in the light of the children of Israel. The psalmist David was crowned king. The enemies thought they had defeated David over and over again. David was running for his life, like hiding like a dog in the caves everywhere you find him. The enemies pursued after him. He would cry after God, and God even gave him opportunities to get back and even to cut the king's clothing. I said, I will not touch the Lord's anointing. But eventually, guess what? The psalmist, the king, was crowned king, and he ruled and reigned. Which brings me to our third point in this last section. God has a plan for our lives. In verse 35, he says, or verse 34, we'll go back to that. Let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein, for God will save Zion and will build the cities of Judah, that they may dwell there and have it in possession. The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. He had a plan for Israel, the children of Israel. And I'm here to tell you, he has a plan for you and for me as children of God. Philippians chapter 1, which is one of my favorite passages, my go-to verse is that when I kind of lose focus, and sometimes I go through struggles, I go through moments where emotions are turned upside down, I go back to the scripture, what God has promised to me. And he tells me in Philippians 1.26, being confident of this very thing, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you're saved, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, what God started in you, he is going to finish. And hallelujah for that. So when we're hurting, when we're facing things that cause us to be brokenhearted, when we're shedding tears, when we're hurt, when life hurts, what can I do? What can you do? Number one, you can pray to the Lord. Secondly, you can praise God with a song. Thirdly, you can maintain a heart of thanksgiving. And fourthly, you can remember God's promises. You see, when you hurt, God hurts. And God knows how to bring the healing. And God knows how to fight our battles. God knows how to answer prayer and to help us in life's journey. Amen? Now, if none of that makes sense tonight... Maybe you're wondering if God really cares about you because you've been through some hurts. May I say that God does care for you. You say, how do, how do I know that God cares for me? God sent his only son, the dear Lord Jesus, born of a virgin and who lived a sinless life and laid down his life for you and me and gave his life as a ransom for anyone who is willing to acknowledge their need and put their trust in Him. You see, I'm one of those believers that do not believe that everyone, when they die, they go to heaven. People go into eternity. And I cannot imagine, I cannot fathom the hurt, the agony that some are spending dealing with tonight because they rejected God's offer of salvation. Forever and ever, just like the rich man in Luke chapter 16 who begged for one drop of water. But for those of us that acknowledge that we have sinned against God and, and maybe we've caused our own selves hurts time and time again and others hurt, 
There is mercy with the Lord. And there's a Savior who loves us and gave his life and died on that cross and shed his blood to pay for sin. And if we'll be willing tonight to put our faith and trust in him, he has promised to cleanse us, to forgive us of all unrighteousness and to give us eternal life as a gift. And so for what it's worth, maybe you're dealing with a hurt. Have you looked to the one who hurt for all of us, the dear Lord Jesus, wounded for our transgressions, chastised, the crown of thorns on his head, brutally beaten, and then put this nail, nails in his hands and died on our behalf. We love him because he first loved us. So am I speaking to someone tonight you're hurting? Let's take heart, let's take hope, and let's yield ourselves to what the psalmist tries to teach us tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for reminding us through this portion of your word. Even as the psalmist dealt with hurt in his own personal life, that Lord, that we would not try to take things into our own hands, but Lord, that we would humble ourselves before the throne of grace, that we would cast every care, every burden upon you. I'm so glad you're never too busy. I'm so glad that you don't keep score necessarily about the wrongdoings, but that you are merciful, that you are loving, and that you know all things. You know what we're dealing with every day. You know what's ahead this week next month, next year. So God, we thank you that you know those things. And I pray that we'll continue to look to you, trust in you. And Lord, that we'll maintain a heart of thanksgiving that will not stop singing because we're in the midst of something difficult. But we'll continue to praise you in the, in the middle of the storm. And that God, that we will remember the promises you've made to us. And Lord, we'll give you thanks for all that you do. We pray all this in your precious name. Amen.